All right, everybody, David Parsons here. This is Nostalgia Trap. Thanks so much for tuning in to our program this week. We've got a great one for you. We're talking to Jared Yates Sexton. He is the author of a book called American Rule, How a Nation Conquered the World But Failed Its People. And we had a really, really fun conversation about sort of the contours of American fascism uh, and where you can find that hiding literally anywhere. Uh, So we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, Just wanted to make everyone aware that we're having a lot of fun with Danny Bessner over on the Patreon. So go over to patreon.com slash nostalgia trap if you want to hear our L.A. film series, we're sort of developing a lot of ideas uh, about what Los Angeles in the 90s in pop culture and in reality uh, represents and how it, it represents a very important moment in understanding the 21st century uh, and our 2020 moment and Trump and everything else. So if you're interested in that, go over to patreon.com slash nostalgia trap. We just put up an episode last week on the film Swingers, uh, which ended up up for me, like totally rearranging how I see that movie. It's a movie that I've been thinking about for a very long time. I saw that movie when I was very young and I've continued watching it. So we had a really fun time with that. So if you want to uh, go check that out, go do that. I encourage you. We're going to have a lot more uh, conversations about those films and other ones in the future. And and uh, we thank all the people who are supporting the show. Uh, but I wanted to mention it because last week on the Swingers episode, Danny said something so outrageous and so controversial that I had to follow up with him about it. So let me see if I can find Danny right now. Hold on a second. I'm going to see if I can wrangle him up. Danny! Danny boy! All right, Danny. Well, we talked about swingers last week. I'm still thinking about swingers a little bit. Uh, how, you, how How's it going? You know, things are going well. Uh, I've been watching a lot of movies about L.A. in the 90s, which is, you know, giving me a new appreciation for my uh, adopted city. Um, (laughs) But, you know, uh, missing rain a little bit, uh, you know, another day in paradise. But things are uh, pretty good here. What about you? Don't you think the the weather is an adjustment here? I mean, I came from I I, I lived in New York for 15 years and coming back to Southern California is is kind of um, adjusting to the 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 lack of pronounced seasons like you expect. I mean, the seasons really do divide the year up in a way that doesn't exist in Southern California. I know like people like to think about and talk about how there are subtle, uh, subtle sort of seasons in Southern California. And I think that's true. And we're experiencing it right now. A little bit of fall, whatever fall is here uh, feels like late summer. But either way, you don't have those pronounced seasons. And I wonder if that's going to if that's going to affect you eventually, although you've been on the West Coast for a little bit, right? Yeah, I, I've been in Seattle for about six years, but I'm I'm in LA uh, right now. You know, due to the COVID pandemic, and I don't know if you people have heard there's a pandemic and things, uh, you know, organized around that. But <laughs> I, I think what's really um, interesting to me about the weather out here is that it sort of you know feeds into the general timelessness of LA as a city, um, and and you know it, it, this timelessness is reflected not only in the weather, uh, but you know also in the eternal search for youth that defines Hollywood. You know, <laughs> <laughs> this being one of the, you know, centers of plastic surgery in the world. And so there's like a general timelessness to L.A. that is both like incredibly appealing and a little bit oppressive, particularly if you're not used to it. Like I, I sincerely do find myself missing rain, missing genuine cold. Um, and it's definitely an adjustment. But, you know, it's it's really the eternal city yeah. in a lot of regards. <laughs> yeah. The freakish. I mean, we talk about this on our episodes, the freakish endless now of, of, of postmodern American life. And, and it seems like L.A. has been projecting that and, and you can really feel that. Um, but you and I have had been, been having really fun conversations on our Patreon about swingers uh, and other L.A. movies from the 90s. We just wrapped a, a conversation with a special guest. Uh, look out for this episode later this week on Clueless. Um, really fun, really fun time talking about Clueless. But either way, you know, it feels like uh, um, it feels like the, the L.A. 90s moment. It, it really, really kind of... Um, matches with with a lot of the themes of nostalgia trap and in, in trying to figure out what you know what what cultural things that can we point to uh in our youth that sort of uh 
told us a little bit of where we might might end up in the 21st century. So that's been really, really fun. And one thing that came up, Danny, that I, I think that people will be uh, wanting to hear more about, and I certainly want to hear more about, because it just kind of it was mentioned by you in the uh, in the in the Swingers episode in passing, and I didn't follow up on it, but so I'm going to follow up now. You mentioned Guy Fieri, and you had mentioned uh, him very positively, like you have an affection for Guy Fieri. What is that all about? Because I feel like Guy Fieri is a is a, is a kind of divisive figure in, in American culture. What is your what is your thing with Guy Fieri? So I think that Guy Fieri is a, is a, or Fieri, I think as he pronounces it, is a, is a divisive figure because some people um, accuse him, and I wouldn't say incorrectly, as kind of promoting the, the worst excesses of American culture in, in terms of literal caloric intake. Um, you know, the food he promote uh, he promotes are not particularly healthy, but also sort of the, the you know um, unthinking melding of cultures that that come when when food comes together in sort of an unthinking ways at, at least people accuse him of that but you know I, I'm, I'm someone who's watched I would say dozens of hours of diners drive-ins and dives um, and I, I think he's actually in some sense and I'm not being um, I'm not being ironic uh, maybe not a working class hero but kind of a small business owner hero mm. and and obviously there are lots of problems with small businesses uh, the petit bourgeois as sort of a source of reaction that you know I'm sure many people are aware of but you know in, in these trying economic times I can't help but feel affection for someone who uses his immense power his his, his literal you know ability to drive people um, to businesses in a way that that genuinely helps people and, and he does seem like a, obviously this could be for the cameras but I you know I've read about him it doesn't seem to be like a genuinely nice guy, someone who who genuinely cares about other people. And I think a lot of the sort of critiques of Fieri that don't, um, you know, center around the kind of the unhealthfulness of the food or its relationship to factory farming, which is, you know, more genuine are basically just critiques of particular cultural signifiers. I believe actually, David, he's a California guy. I believe he's from Northern California. Um, and I, I believe that a lot of the critiques are really just class critiques of, of people that are, are viewed as a, a sort of a, of a lower class. But I don't know. It seems like you're not a Fieri head. Why don't <laughs> You, uh, <laughs> I don't know. What's your criticism of him? <laughs> no, now I feel like a total snob because I'm like, you know, buying the Anthony Bourdain criticism of all that shit of putting burgers on donuts and stuff like that. But I totally I mean, I totally get the uh, the, the the appeal, you know, and I, I'm wondering, like, in part, like, are you a food guy and, and what led you to, to watch this show? I, I'm wondering about that. But yeah, I totally see the other end of it, too, which is the kind of like he's you know he he kind of exists as a, as a sort of kid rock figure right like someone who someone who like embraces a sort of iconography of the so-called you know trailer trash something like that you know with the, the sort of low culture he wears shirts with dice and and flames on them and he has like um you know the, everything about the signifiers i think you're right they draw people they draw a certain sort of li especially like liberal disdain so maybe i'm participating in that partly for sure um but also just like watching his like blonde dyed goateed face being stuffed with these chili dogs just makes me fucking sick uh and and makes me feel like um you know all the things that you said earlier which is that you know he's associated with with some of the um not just like low cultures beyond that it's like um it's just you know participating in, in in some of the like worst elements of american imperialism and just feeling like that excess sure. <laughs> of just stuffing your mouth with meat yeah. you know there there is something to that for me and so yeah i do think you're you're probably right in, in like it, it's liberal snobbery that that makes him a figure of, of of hatred in some way but he's also just like a very it feels like he captures something um, about like the white suburban Trumpian American, even if he might not be that himself, if that makes sense. No, for sure. I mean, you know, I think that that the critique of him that one could make is, is the critique of American excess, which is absolutely represented in the types of foods he champions and uh, and generally just his personality. Right. He, he drives around. I don't really know cars, but in sort of this red convertible, you know, that is definitely a gas guzzler. And he's just like kind of here to party and stuff along those lines. So I, I absolutely uh, understand uh, those those criticisms. And I, I do agree that there's some sort of like reflection of, of what might you know the proverbial jet ski dealer owner that that votes for <laughs> right, Trump. Right. Um, so I mean, I, I I take all those criticisms, but I also think that that in a, a unique way, he, he's a very uh, appealing 
character. He's a very uh, appealing person in the sense of his genuineness, um, the fact that you could kind of watch, you know, speaking of timeless, there's definitely been days where I've watched, you know, 14 diners, drive-ins and dives um, and, and just sitting around sick or, or bored one day. And, and there's a, a comfort to that excess. Uh, and I think that, you know, that's one of the, it's, it's one of the reasons that people, you know, like the idea of the American empire, the, the this notion that you could just consume um, everything about it. And I think like if Guy Fieri is a problem, he's kind of like our problem. Like mm -hmm. we created Guy Fieri. And so we shouldn't criticize the Fieri himself, but the, the conditions that um, created him. And I actually think it's interesting that you brought up Anthony Bourdain, which I would say is kind of like the liberal elites, like, you know, king of cooking sure um, and 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 not to you know the the tragic circumstances of his death and, and the serious problems of his addiction and not to trivialize that but i've actually gone back and recently watched a lot of his um you know the bourdain shows and no reservations was i think the first one and then the second one was you basically no reservations but a different name um uh, go walk outside da, da, da. but anyway people know the show uh, and they're actually you know it's good when he criticizes like Henry Kissinger when he goes to Cambodia and he's not wrong about things like that but what I, going back you know from my own you know specialty in, in US foreign policy I was surprised to see how how much there's a lack of structural critique in the Bourdain um, you know approach to the world it's like he goes to these places and it's like it really sucks that like the US fucked them over but he doesn't actually say like what, what it would entail or the type of of structures that enable this um, world to uh, that the he rightly deplores uh, to exist. Yeah, so I think yeah. that it's interesting to actually you know compare the messages of a uh, of a Fieri and a Bourdain, and in in various ways I think they're they're both seriously wanting. Um, but I would say, in my opinion, the major critiques of, of Fieri are, are organized around the cultural signifiers that he associates himself with, um, and I don't think he's as toxic a figure as Kid Rock. Um, I think if you actually <laughs> listen uh listen to yeah, people whose restaurants he yeah. promoted like he's genuinely helped their businesses you know in like in like a real way and I, I imagine quite a few of these were struggling and you know like it's not the most important thing in the world but it also doesn't hurt <laughs> yeah um and i take your point on bourdain as well because you know bourdain is someone who i, I think that a lot of lefties uh, really love and, and and rightfully so you know he was sort of and i think the reason why his death was so uh painful in part because there was a recognition that god like as sad as this is to say there aren't a lot of like hunter s thompson ass type characters in our culture that have that level of, of voice so you know any critique i have of him is is also couched within the the the, the idea that i miss anthony bourdain and i wish he was still yeah, he was great around yeah um but but yeah i i remember listening to him on my uh, my nemesis uh mark Marin's podcast the wtf um <laughs> in which uh you know i was i was you know i remember listening to this because i was I, I was like in the back of an uber i think in new york i listening to it on my headphones and, and being like are you fucking kidding me because what bourdain was saying was was very different from that Henry Kissinger thing that we all know, which is really a, a great piece of, 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 of vitriol that so actually sounds like Hunter S. Thompson in terms of um, how much he he hates Kissinger and, and, and the, 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 the destruction that he wrought in Cambodia and Southeast Asia. But, um, you know, in this episode with Marin, he's talking about food and he gives this he says, like, you know, when I'm in the Middle East and when I'm, you know, when I'm going to places like Iran, you know, our, our ability to like uh, break bread together is, is what brings us together. And, and he gives this really kind of trite liberal vision of like kind of how food culture can bring us together. And, 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 and not only that, it's really politics and political groups and ideologies that sort of ruin that and, 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 and get it and don't understand that and take us away from that. Um, which is really interesting. Yeah, which is Gen X, not which is like actually he, he's a boomer, but I think that he's actually articulated more through Gen X lens, which is Gen X nonsense, right? And if we're going to critique people for overconsumption, flying around the world to a million countries and planes <laughs> isn't exactly you know that right, distance right. from uh, American consumption, right? And I I just want to say I really do like Anthony Bourdain. Uh, I mean, I think he's actually a very good writer, and I think that the shows are really entertaining, and he, I really do miss his perspective. But I think that that there might 
actually be more connecting him with someone like Guy Fieri, at least if we're looking from a structural perspective than people might um, initially imagine. And I think it's reflected in exactly what you said. At, at least, you know, Fieri doesn't pretend to politics. Yeah. Right. right. And in yep. some sense, that's what I appreciate about him. Right. He's not pretending to be anything but, but what he is, which is some dude from Ferndale, California, a rural county in Northern California, who probably likes to party and likes to eat a lot of shit and, you know, hang out <laughs> with his bros. Um, yeah. But he's also inclusive. I mean, I think... I mean, I haven't watched the show in chronological order, but there is like a genuine inclusion to the people that he visits. You know, it's not just like barbecue places run by old white guys. There's like unique spaces. Um, and I think that's an important thing. And mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and some, in some level, I think we on the left should be allowed to like lose ourselves in, in, at some points in culture and sort of this ridiculous entertainment aspect. And that, that would actually be an important element to like a post-capitalist world. Mm-hmm. Ne- not necessarily the excess, but sort of the enjoyment of the culture and, and low culture as well as I think as important as middlebrow uh, culture, which is, I think, essentially what Bourdain is. Well, I'm going to forget those two guys and, and just watch the Great British Baking Show because that's what makes me happy. And it's a it's a it's an apolitical space. It's a place for uh, for me to feel safe. And I think that's a whole other conversation is why that show is popular, Danny. But but speaking of uh, speaking of conversations, we're doing all these L.A. Um, L.A. 90s film episodes lately. We're going to be doing a lot more stuff on pop culture on the Patreon Uh I'm, I'm, you notice I'm pronouncing it correctly now, Danny, since you corrected me. Yeah, I, I'm glad I shamed you into David, uh, new listeners. David used to pronounce it Patron, Patron? Patreon. How did you pronounce it? Patreon. Patreon. Yeah. Patreon. Yeah. So at least I've shamed him into saying it correctly. So, so you're pa- welcome. Yeah. So patreon.com uh, slash nostalgia trap is where, is where you do that. And we have a great conversation coming up right now with uh, Jared Yates Sexton, which Danny, I think you'll appreciate. So thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. And we'll talk to you again very soon. Thanks, David. Talk to you soon. All right. So as promised, let's get to our interview with Jared Yates Sexton. Uh, Like I said, I had a lot of fun talking with him. He's someone who you should know. His coverage of Trump's America. And what I mean by that is sort of the contours of American culture and politics and their specific iteration in the last four years has been something um, that he's been covering in a number of publications, and his coverage of that stuff has gotten a lot of attention. Um, But Jared is someone who's written a book that goes back into American history. It's called American Rule, How a Nation Conquered the World and Failed Its People. And he'll talk a little bit in this conversation of the the origin of this project and its connection to, you know, big, quote-unquote, big American histories like Howard Zinn and things like that. But I think he has a really savvy and thoughtful take on a lot of the ideas that we circulate here uh, on Nostalgia Trap about sort of drawing lessons uh, and ideas from particular eras in American history and and ones that that are are often at odds with the sort of way these things are uh, functioning in the American imagination even today. So that's a long way of saying that his book is awesome. And it's a take on American history that I think a lot of people that listen to this show would enjoy. So go check out his book, American Rule. And I hope you enjoy this conversation. Uh, Here is me uh, talking with Jared Yates Sexton. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Good to have you on. Thank thank you. You train on the show. So I'm glad we're doing this. Yeah, um, High Weirdness is a book that I, I, I would like to, that sparked a lot of ideas in me, and I'd like to sort of write a, a, a book that, that, that sort of corresponds to a lot of what that, that book talked about. But he, he, he looked at the, the 70s through the lens of three uh, different kind of prophets, uh, Robert Anton Wilson, uh, Terrence McKenna, and Philip K. Dick, um, and they, all, all, all of whom had sort of like, you know, psychedelic or mystical experiences during the 1970s and connected to all this stuff. So, I just read. <laughs> yeah, I just read the Cosmic Trigger series. <laughs> right, right. So there you go. And like, it's just it was a really fun conversation. And that that if I were going to write another book, it would be not uh, not necessarily about those men, uh, but sort of about that world uh, and how that for me, like kind of how that world um, sort of seeped into mainstream culture. I'm interested in sort of that that like occult end of of uh, the 1970s for sure. Yeah, I have to tell you, so I finished American Rule and I was like, okay, so, you know, it's like that thing where like you run a lot or you ride a bike a lot and you sort of have to cool down so you don't like get cramps. 
And I was like, I want to go in a weird direction. So I picked up the the Cosmic Trigger uh, series and I read it. And the amazing part about it is it's like, I don't for a second believe that this is the secret of the universe. But like, I was just like, yeah, let's go. Let's let's just see where this thing takes us. Hmm. And I think one of the interesting things about the 1970s and in and, and, and American history, I feel like, again, it's very cyclical. I feel like there are these moments where uh, America feels incredibly confident about itself. It's the hero of the universe. It can't do anything wrong. You have a moment of quote unquote consensus, which is not even real. And then you have those moments of crisis of confidence. And in those moments of crisis of confidence, like literally anything can happen. And in the 1970s, like post-Vietnam, post-Watergate, all of that stuff, before Reagan came around and was basically a, re- a revivalist preacher, before all that stuff happened, like literally anybody in America could come up with a different direction. And maybe that's where we were going to go. Mm. I, I, I find it endlessly fascinating. Yeah, that's that's kind of makes me think about the moment we're living in right now. I think in part, that's that's kind of what attracted me to making this show uh, in 2014. I was disappointed that the 2012 Mayan apocalypse didn't, uh, didn't you know, t- take place in the in the way that we imagined uh and i was like you know i i still feel that we're we're in the, a, a sort of crisis of confidence moment and and, and certainly the Trump years have uh, accelerated that feeling, that sort of like vibe in the air. And we've talked about it. Uh, I think Bessner, Danny Bessner on our show a few uh, a few weeks ago called it the plastic moment, right? The idea that we can like, maybe there's possibility here. We can like move in different directions. It, I mean, that's a hopeful way of looking at what's going on right now, for sure. I, you know, I've gone... So before I, I had a weird path, actually. So before I started covering politics in 2016, I was really bordering on nihilism, man. I was just and then obviously like 2016 just totally boils over. And I had to become somewhat of an optimist out of necessity. You know what I mean? Like I looked into the deep inky black and I was like, I can't. I can't. Do this. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And and. And I feel like actually that that plastic moment is a great way to think about it, because this is actually one of the reasons why I wrote the book in the first place is I feel like we have been so trapped by our own mythology and our own alternate American universe, which we've actually tried to capture the entire world in and have succeeded to a certain extent. And we're now watching that illusion sort of flicker. And Donald Trump is the perfect Rosetta Stone for that. Like yeah. everyone sees through it. You mm-hmm. know, he's he's an obvious phony. He's an obvious charlatan. And, and every day that he talks about American exceptionalism is another day that somebody in middle America wakes up behind the wheel and is like, I don't think so. Right. I think something's wrong here. And so I think it's I think there's a real possibility. And this is where I'm optimistic. I think there's a real possibility that if we can somehow or another slip the chains of that mythology, we can figure out something. Like we can actually make the world better. But that being said, I mean, I think we're on the brink of that inky abyss. I really do. And I think it's I think it's a precipice that can go either way, to be honest. Yeah, um, I agree. It's funny that you say you say you started uh, you were nihilistic and then you started covering politics, uh, which seems like it would mean uh, you would, it would send me even more. I mean, for me, like d- politics is really de- depressing, you know, to think about it. And, yep. and I think that's part of what um part of what explains why so many people are alienated from it is it's just it's sort of um you know it's gotten really really dark i mean even to the point where i don't know when you hear for me like the, the the tweet from kamala last night about like don't worry we're gonna we're gonna be fracking we're still pro fracking is kind of yep. like god we really are trapped in this my soul died a little bit with the fracking thing <laughs> i'm not gonna yeah. lie it, you know it i would i i i think it's important to say that my optimism doesn't come from a traditional place of optimism. Like I don't expect West Wing music to start playing and, you know, all of a sudden, because there's that funny thing, right? Where it's like everyone expects the Republicans to just sort of like have a moment of conscience and suddenly give up power or their path to power and suddenly work together. And then all of a sudden we'll stand there as like, you know, I don't know, the sun sets on the Lincoln Memorial or whatever. Like, it's not that optimism. It's the optimism, actually, of all of that garbage disintegrating Mm. and all of a sudden not being stuck in the muck of American exceptionalism and, and flags and eagles and national anthems. Like, I actually think that there is a hope 
that this stuff might reach its its terminal point. Mm. And you no longer be like, oh, yeah, this is the American Century or Pax Americana or whatever, you know, somebody dreamed up over at the project for a new American Century. Mm -hmm. And and that maybe this stuff can start to go away. And, And my hope, and again, I think maybe it was jumping into that abyss, like the hope is to look at it and understand how this stuff actually works is to see, um, you know, even the best made watch, like eventually breaks, you know what I mean? Because entropy takes over, like eventually it doesn't matter how, how well you made the gears, eventually that watch will stop working. And it feels like this entire illusion is just, it's, it's coming to its inevitable end. Mm. I, I hope you're right. And I mean, for me, like, I mean, even the even the larger the larger poison of nationalism itself seems like a a, a prison uh, and one that and one that we'll have to get over if we want to really address the the crises we're in, particularly around climate change or else. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be states closing themselves off and and and, and the same sort of um, territorial insanity that marked the 20th century and centuries before that. So I, I wonder, like, you know, your book, American Rule, um, w- thinking about American exceptionalism and going back and sort of your, your what I like about your book is it's sort of um, pulling out sort of lessons, you know, sort of lessons that weren't really internalized. Like, the, the, in, order, in other words, they're sort of like, uh, the wrong lessons are often are often extracted from particular moments in American history. And I'd love to talk to you about like moments that you and I have lived through because we're about the same age uh, and, and yeah. the, the, drawing the wrong lessons from things like Oklahoma City and Columbine and 9-11. I mean, it's so big. But I wonder, like, what was the idea behind writing this book? That's a very NPR ass question. I know. But I'm kind of like, I, I love <laughs> NPR ass questions. <laughs> like, wh- why? Uh, why write this book? And in particular, like, how do you avoid falling into like the the American exceptionalist trap while you're writing about it, because I think it's very common to sort of for for historians or people that write about the whole big books about American history to sort of fall into the trap of, well, there's still the Constitution and Bill of Rights and we got to live up to those ideals. And, and in other words, that West Wing trap that you're talking about, I, I'm just kind of wondering what are your thoughts on and on, on what was your what was your sort of idea uh, in writing this book? Well, you know, I, I, I I'm an academic. And I've gone through my own education and I, you know, I'm not a historian, but I've taken my fair number of classes. I've read my fair number of books. Right. But so much of it is West Wing ass type (laughs) stuff. Right. Like it's that. And it's um, what I would call CNN documentary history. Right. Ronald Reagan said, tear down this wall and it just crumbled. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's how it worked. And that's how the Soviet Union lost. Well, what ended up happening was when Trump won, it was like this moment where, again, it was like that illusion flickered. And I was like, oh, yeah, the the, the arc of the universe does not bend towards justice. Like there's something wrong there. There's something wrong with the lie. And I think, you know, as damaging as it has been having Trump after Obama, it made very clear a lot of the things that Obama was selling the public were mythologies. Right. They they were they were stories that made it like and made it possible for him to be president in the first place, but also to govern the way he did. And I realized then I was like, I need to relearn American history and I need to, like, learn it from experts that I've never heard of before. And I need to start looking at all these alternate histories. And I started at the beginning. And I'll tell you the honest to God truth. I really didn't know what to expect from the from the founding because I thought I had a decent idea. Man, it, it, what what blew my face off was immediately finding out that the framers of the Constitution did not have the authority to write the Constitution, and that many historical scholars consider it an uh, uh, aristocratic coup. And like, in all of a sudden, I was like, "Wait a second, is that something that people hold up?" And I reached out to every historian I know, and they're like, "Oh yeah, that's absolutely what happened." And I was like, you have to be shitting me. This is like (laughs) what's out there. And when that happened, (laughs) what ended up happening from that, when I started from the seed and I worked my way back to the present, I started to notice exactly what you're talking about, which are these moments where we could have had something approaching progress or something approaching equality. And what has happened at every one of these uh, uh, venture points, every one of these crossroads, is that the wealthy and the powerful have always chosen a way to maintain control. And the quickest way to maintain control in America is to say, no, we didn't make a mistake. America's great. We're on the right path. And it just continually ventured and ventured and ventured. And it kept creating new fault lines that created left and right 
in groups, out groups. Mm. And every time that America has ever faced a moment of actual reconsideration, we will move a little bit toward it. Right. And by the way, this is anti John Meacham. <laughs> right. Well right. Is. Right. Like, I, I actually I wish I would have done this research before I read Meacham's latest book, because I read it on a beach at one point. And I was just like, wow, this is a, a a very nice little history book. And now I'm just like, what a farce this is, mm, you know. Mm, and mm-hmm. if you actually look at American history, it's not about better angels. It's about the American system of control occasionally being troubled and then assimilating whatever troubles it. And uh, and and making sure that it doesn't spread mm. and making sure that it doesn't create a bigger disruption. Right. So when you actually look at it through that, everything from the election of Jefferson in 1800 to civil rights to, uh, you know, everything that we've seen the past few years, it's always small concessions met with another method of control. And that's actually the true history of America. And unfortunately, we, we have yet to really look that in the eye. Mm. Yeah, uh, it seems like um, it seems like your book falls into a, a, a category of, of of American history that 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 is sort of uh, that I think I, I've noticed a lot lately in terms of the idea that there's some there's a there's a, another story that people are discovering, right? This sort of story under the, underneath the story, and it's really like a compelling thing. Like, I mean, I, I, what would be what, what do you think? Like, how would you see your relationship, uh, your book, and your your the history you're telling as relating to something like? Of like Howard Zinn's narrative, like the very well-known sort of story underneath the story kind sure. of guy. Um, did you read that stuff? And like, in other words, I'm sort of wondering, like, how did you put this narrative together? Well, first and foremost, I mean, when I read Zinn, I mean, I read it, I, I want to say in 2003, mm. I was, I was the guy who was walking around my campus with like, Kerouac's On the Road and Howard Zinn and, you know, the little red book. That, that, <laughs> that's what I do. You know what I mean? And, and that was like one of the moments where that that illusion started flickering for me and I started educating myself. But I still had this thought that it was still sort of like it, uh, like a Greek mythology. Heroes, villains, yes. you know, yes. uh, messiahs and goats and all of this stuff. And what what I would say about my book in relationship to something like Zen and that that that's even incredible to even have to think about. I, I really enjoy these books that are telling the story about people in history who have been oppressed. What I am fascinated by is how white supremacy maintains control Mm. and power Mm -hmm. and how it hides itself. So I would say that American Rule is actually the story about how white patriarchal supremacy not only founded the country, but how it has continued to infect the country and hide from the view using this idea of exceptionalism. And and the, the, the truth is, when you actually look at it through that lens, that this is a group of people who have maintained control, and they have been Democrats, they have been Republicans, they've been Whigs, they've been everybody that you could possibly imagine, that that group, as they've maintained control, uh, they, they have continued to hide their tracks. And they hide their tracks by controlling reality and how we think about reality. They, they produce everything from, you know, movies, TV shows, history books. And so, the conventional um, Forrest Gump, you know, I mean, when you really, <laughs> yeah, when you like, totally. really, when you really sit with it, we sadly enough, we're very lost in these mythologies and we don't understand that they're propaganda and we don't understand that they've always been propaganda. And so I, I'm really fascinated by and like right now for my new book. I've gone all the way back to like ancient Rome and I'm going to go, I'm going to retell the history of Western civilization. And immediately what you find is it's like white Christian fascists all the way through, yeah, turtles yeah. all the way down, man. And and I'm just fascinated by how these people have perpetuated their control. It's it's interesting because it's like, it, it, it isn't like people like Jordan Peterson are invoking, you know, the same sort of like ancient Rome, Western civilization shit, but they're doing it with a very different purpose in mind, it seems like. Well, that's, so that's the thing about it. And like, I, I listen, you know, if, if anybody follows me on social media, they know that I'm like, I'm screaming fascist pretty much every day mm. because we're, we're, we're dealing with a fascistic movement. And one of the problems is that, and again, like saving private Ryan. Right. America came in and took care of it. And we're the heroes of World War Two. Don't ask any other questions about what went on, you know, and we, we we've done a real disservice to ourselves in that we don't understand fascism and we don't understand the, the things that led to World War Two and, you know, the period in between one and two. And the truth is that America helped inspire fascism. 
America um, uh, inspired Nazism. And actually, there were people in America who were not just Nazis, but we had fascists all over the country. We had groups of people who were calling on us to form an alliance with Adolf Hitler, including Charles Lindbergh and the America First Committee, which Donald Trump still plagiarizes. Mm. And so so we, we have this problem where we, we have lost the thread. And that's one of the re- why right now feels so weird. We don't understand our past. We don't understand our present. And so there's no vision for the future. Because if you don't understand the past and the present, how can you ever figure out where you're going? Yeah, and we're just yeah. totally caught caught in what, what you would call the nostalgia trap. Mm-hmm. It's 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 weaponized nostalgia. It is it, and that's what fascism works off of, is it feeds off of dying myths of exceptionalism and then floats everybody in conspiracy theories and promises of of glory and revitalization. Mm. Yeah, uh, it's funny to hear you talk about American fascism because it's a, a word that's come up a lot since since Trump's been elected. And it's kind of interesting because it's like, well, wait a second, <laughs> you know, this isn't um, this isn't something that's just a product of Donald Trump. This is uh, you know Donald Trump accelerating something that's um, or bringing out something that's been um, in American society forever. Uh, but it's it's kind of it, I think a lot of people listening to you would say, wait a second, they think about fascists as like maybe some sort of you know white white supremacist militia group somewhere or you know uh the proud boys like those are those are the fascists and i agree with that those are like those are i will call those guys fascists but it seems like you're identifying like a larger stream like you're like saving private ryan is actually an expression of some some sort of american fascism right and i mean when i think about that movie it gets me really riled up i think we've done uh, some some episodes talking about saving private ryan a lot but like that i mean that ending where he's like earn this you know, oh. like to me, like that's still and the, and not only that, I mean, the, they fast forward to like old Matt Damon in the cemetery asking his wife, did I lead a good life? Was I a good American? And then the fucking movie ends with like a three minute just pornographic I, American flag um, waving as you sit there and contemplate all the corpses that you're supposed to be sort of feeling like responsible to, you know, very much like a corpse like like Jesus Christ, that you would feel some sort of moral, uh, even deep spiritual allegiance to because they died for you. I feel like that movie was a really fucked up movie. Um, and so I can oh, yeah. I can very much like align myself with <laughs> with your your idea there that like, you know, there's a in other words, there's an American fascism that you're describing in this book that's not just, you know, located in extremist groups, but it's actually in the fabric of American culture. Well, the damnedest thing is it's all over the place and it involves a bunch of people who have no idea that they're actually fascist they just think that they're patriots and by the way real fast while we're talking about saving private ryan the old matt damon makeup was terrible just <laughs> terrible wait was makeup. that matt damon are you kidding that was a, i if, if i think it, that's if an actual old else. i think that's just an actual old dude uh i'm gonna have to check on that because <laughs> if, if i'm picturing it in my mind's eye it is some really terrible old makeup <laughs> so i i will say this uh, first and foremost like this story that somehow or another that fascist we, we treat fascism like it was this aberration in 20th century Western Europe. Right. It just popped up. Nobody knows where the hell it came from. I guess maybe World War One. I, I don't know. That's ridiculous. America has been absolutely encaptured by proto fascism since its very beginning. The founding of America was put in place to privilege white supremacist slave holding men. Okay, Adolf Hitler, by the way, was totally in love with America. He thought it was like the 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 first great explicitly white country that was ever made. He looked at our founding, our hierarchical laws. Man, did he love the Confederate States of America and Jim Crow. I mean, he, he just loved everything about America. He did not want to go to war with us. And again, many Americans didn't want to go to war with him. And by the way, real fast, while we're on the subject, immediately after we beat the Nazis, we we're like, come aboard, fellas. We've yep. got to beat us some communists. <laughs> totally. Right? Yep. O- Operation Paperclip. Uh, no, we'll take as many of you as you can. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. All of us together. And the problem is that we ended up creating our own brand of American fascism post-World War II. It was a special type of fascism, and it was about open and closed systems of power. We were going all over the world undermining democratically elected leaders. We were pushing and pulsing you know, propaganda in every country that we thought wouldn't vote the right way. By the way, read between the lines. They were people of color, mm-hmm. right? And, and, and white, white people could choose for themselves, but people of color needed help along, 
right? And meanwhile, the CIA is doing that. The FBI is putting down every single group in America that they think could possibly ever help people of color. Every war that we've ever had has basically been followed by fascistic discrimination and murders in the streets of people of color. And all of these conspiracy theories that we're currently swimming in are all fascistic conspiracy theories. The system has been taken over by puppet masters, i.e. Jews. It's, you know, we, we have liberal traders who are working in line with them. And then we have people of color who aren't smart enough to understand they're being manipulated. So what do we have to do? We have to start preemptively killing people mm. because if we don't kill them, they'll kill us first. I mean, that is fascism in essence. Yeah. And so America has created this new thing. And unfortunately, that nostalgia trap for what fascism, what we thought it was, right, that has kept us from recognizing that we are in a late stage of a fascistic takeover mm. in this country, mm -hmm. fascistic movement in the Republican Party. And it has left us completely defenseless against it and left and left us basically waiting on somebody to save us. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a horrible feeling uh, and, and one that we've talked about a lot on the show. I mean, in, in, in terms of I mean, to, to even to watch just like the excitement of young people around Bernie Sanders earlier in this in this year was a symptom of that. Right. Was it feeling like I, 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 there were a lot of people on the left, like young leftists who were who were cognizant of the fact that this felt like almost a last chance for this style of political victory. Like, you know what I mean? Like Bernie was the last guy that we could like try and uh, try, try, try and uh, kind of confront this system with. Um, and, and I feel like you know, you're that that part of it seems like uh, a, a, a definite um, through line in these four years has been a, a sort of. A, a, um, a sort of desperation almost, you know, like, right. I mean, it feels like that, that, I don't know. I almost feel like the, that, 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 I don't know. I could be wrong. I'm just, I'm just kind of thinking out loud here and I, I invite what, what you think about it. Cause you're thinking about this stuff too, but um, it, you know, it almost feels like the, the energy has gone towards Biden uh, in part because uh, like, like in other, in other words, that fight that was happening among Democrats in the primaries has, has, is starting to dissolve a little bit. And like, even the people that I th thought of as the most like radical leftist I see are like, you got to vote for Biden. We got to vote for Biden, which tells me that they are, I mean, at least they're, they they're thinking along your lines, right? They're thinking that we're, we're, we're facing an extraordinary threat. I think there's a lot of different things happening yeah. there. I mean, I, I, I think there's a real misunderstanding of what politics in this country has been. For instance, you know, everybody over the past eight years has just been like, I can't believe the Democrats are fighting like this. And it's like, no, that's the Democratic Party. Mm. I mean, they, they, they have one civil war after another. And there's always an insurgent candidate who, you know, troubles sort of the mainstream kind of Democratic, you know, structure, the right. the the. The order. Uh, so it's it's but it's also one of these situations where, unfortunately, politics has been turned into a TV show. It's been turned into something that we're supposed to watch, not really participate in. Maybe every four years you go out and vote. But meanwhile, you're supposed to cheer on the new hero who shows up on screen. It's I think there's a reason why the most lucrative entertainment franchise right now is something like the Avengers, which, by the way, if you actually look at the Avengers. Sorry about this side thing. But I think <laughs> about this all the time. Yeah, go for it. The number, the number one franchise in a moment of powerlessness in America is a superhero team that consists of the embodiment of America, a weapons manufacturer, the personification of the atomic bomb, uh, a reformed Soviet spy, artificial intelligence, and an Aryan god who <laughs> was transformed into Jesus. Right. So, like, if, if you really want to sit with it, like, we've been waiting on a messiah to show up. Like, look how they treated Robert Mueller. Robert Mueller was a Republican, like, Oh, God. Right. Yeah. Don't get me started on that. Yeah. Yeah. He wasn't going to get to the bottom of, of, of the Russia situation. And meanwhile, you go on social media and it's like people are photoshopping his head on Captain America. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, Nancy Pelosi told off Donald Trump. You better wait. It's going to happen. But what happened was a commodification of politics. It turned into a team sport. And so as a result, you have to buy all the T-shirts. You have to buy all the, you know, the little widgets and all the stuff that expresses who you are politically. Meanwhile, the entire thing has turned into a total illusion. Like Donald Trump is to the right, the guy who will go out and fight for them. And as a result, he has to be their messiah. And so they will launder literally anything he does wrong. I mean, we, what else is QAnon? 
QAnon is the religious worship of Donald Trump, mm. right? Mm -hmm. it, it makes everything he does infallible. It makes him the savior of the human race. He's fighting satanic forces. And meanwhile, white identity evangelicals have gotten on board. They now worship him. It doesn't matter what he does, what he says, they're with him. And I think that we've got lost in that illusion. And like you were saying, now with Biden, it's like, we can't even have a conversation about who Joe Biden actually is, because if we actually talk about the history of Joe Biden, we have to talk about the fact that he was one of the architects of the of the modern police state. Mm -hmm. He was one of the architects of mass incarceration. He has been wrong on one thing after another. It doesn't mean that he hasn't done good things, but we can't have nuanced three dimensional ideas of politicians because they need to be mythic. Yeah, they need to be perfect and above any type of questioning, which is one of our biggest problems, I think. Yeah. Um, and, and just and just the, the larger issue of, of seeing politics as, you know, electoral every four years. Uh, I mean, not only not only electoral, but literally like president presidential elections. And that's it. I mean, there's that issue, but also just like the the I mean, that's part of why, you know, I'm teaching this class on the civil rights movement right now. And like, you know, the, 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 the reason I like teaching those classes about that subject is because they're sort of like object lessons in, in what politics can be and like what yes. like the sort of. Um, how to be uh, proactive and be actually quote unquote doing things uh, that are moving that are moving the situation um, beyond voting. and And that part of it, I think, is really something that that people don't know much about. I mean, generally, when people think about the civil rights movement, they think Martin Luther King Jr. said, "I have a dream, and white liberals cried, and we all st started loving each other. But that's not that's that's part of these mythologies that you're talking about. These are just stories. And it feels like, um, you know, the stories that we tell uh, have, have have obscured, uh, have taken the, the wrong lessons from all of these different historical moments. And in other words, even the West Wingers and the liberals will tell that story about the civil rights movement rather than this complex story of millions of people, uh, ordinary people involved in the type of activism that moved the story. So uh, that that part of it is, is you know, uh, about losing our history, you know, and re really like losing and turning history into I, I mean, I, I think nostalgia trap is one way of putting it, but in other words, it's it's turning our real history into uh, uh, into myths that that don't really yeah. that don't really they serve a purpose. I mean, they do serve a purpose, they but do. they but they don't serve one that 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 actually helps ordinary people to break out of the the systems of authority and power that are that are that are keeping us that down. And I I think part of that, I wonder like. How did you approach the subject of capitalism in your book? Because it's like it seems like a, a book like yours is, is is one that could very much, you know, fall into a sort of discourse about capitalism one way or the other. But um, I, I wonder how does that fall into your your your, your narrative? Well, you know, well, first and foremost, I just want to say I, you, you touched on something really interesting there. And it, it's like the idea of power and what it is and how it works. Like, like for instance, like the uh, civil rights movement and, and the 60s counterculture, people look at it as if it was a giant victory because it was so inspirational and beautiful. And like that the, the optics were perfect and like, you know, like a speech was given at this memorial or whatever. Uh, meanwhile, the Republican Party has spent the last 40 years meticulously winning basically every local, regional race, everything that matters in terms of how to rig a system to your own desires. Meanwhile, liberals have controlled the culture, like every movie, TV show or whatever, and it's been self-celebratory. That Those are the arguments we like to make, which are the symbolic victories, right? Oh, we didn't win this one, but we were on the right side of history. Or you know, we, we, we have the right ideas on our side. And meanwhile, Ruth Bader Ginsburg dies and it's just like, oh, you're talking about like 20, 30, 40 years of everything going through a court that is particularly weighted on one side of a thing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which is, which, which is the matter of power that most people don't like to sit with. And then you deal with the mythologies of like civil rights and all that. And you realize it's like, the civil rights movement was an amazing job of organization and political pressure. And by the way, pressuring uh, the, the the narrative that took place every single day. It's one of the reasons why the pro-war movement worked the way that it did. People like to pretend it ended the war. It didn't end the war, right? And in fact, the anti-war movement basically dissipated the moment that the draft went away mm -hmm. and the moment that all of a sudden capitalism started co-opting movements. And I didn't understand this. And, and this is one thing I learned writing American Rule, which kind of blew my mind. 
It is capitalism's ability to adapt and to absorb everything that attacks it. And the moment that something actually attacks capitalism and wounds it, capitalism is like, there's money to be made there. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and and so I actually think one of the bigger problems that we have, and by the way, I'm speaking to you as somebody who is on Twitter. I use Twitter as well as I possibly can. But I also use it understanding that it is, it's a capitalist machine. You know, it's, yeah. it's a pinball game. Totally. It doesn't matter how many followers you have. It doesn't matter how many retweets and likes you get. It is this capitalistic box that we have been taught to scream into instead of getting in the streets, instead of organizing, instead of winning elections, instead of bringing people together for a common purpose, which, by the way, is something social media can and has done, but it has now moved away from. Right. Like we saw where that could happen and all of the all of the sites have sort of tweaked their algorithms to keep it from happening. Mm. But now when something upsets us, we don't go out in the streets necessarily in March, although we do have marches. But we have a machine that we scream into and we use it as if we're a corporation dropping a PR release <laughs> that says something about how we feel about a situation. And then that somehow or another absolves us of our necessary uh, use of our own action and sovereignty. So what I what I didn't understand was that capitalism was such an incredibly adaptive and sort of poisonous thing that everything that attacks it it will swallow, absorb, and resell to anybody who is using it to attack them, which is, uh, I mean, it's maniacal. It's one of the craziest things I've ever actually realized. Yeah, it's it's pretty savage. And, and it's something that I think has actually gotten even um, even more brazen in pop culture. Like, I feel like uh, over the years, like the prestige TV shows have been like, oh, you know, capitalism is an evil poison that infects people's minds. And you see that in like Sopranos and Mad Men and, you know, but it's it's gone even further i mean if you watch shows on amazon now i mean they're like oh like shows that shows that are all about sort of showing the contours of how evil capitalism is how everything is run by pedophiles and monsters and these sort of like shadowy creatures i mean it, it totally I, I mean it fits with QAnon uh, in, in that way you know that sort of like you can be, capitalism only, almost allows you to believe that i mean capitalism will even sell q you know at some point like yeah. it's it's i mean actually it's not that capitalism will sell Q. Capitalism is selling Q. I knew I know Facebook just kicked them off, but I mean, all that social media content is driving capitalism. That's yeah. you know, it's part of their corporate machine. Uh, and and we've watched Facebook be basically turned into like a communications network for Nazis and all sorts of crazy shit. Um, and that's an, that's a that's a, a a weird part of that of what we're talking about here. Well, and I think and I'm so glad that you brought that up, because one of the things and this was something, again, I didn't understand until I was writing American Rule. Like, I didn't understand that once you reach a certain level, you're what I now call post-political. Like, I used to think that everybody like got their ballot in the mail and they were like, I am a Democrat. Right. And I am a Republican or whatever. And then I suddenly realized that once you reach reach a certain cruising altitude and you get a certain amount of power and a certain amount of wealth, you're whatever you need to be. Like mm -hmm. you can be a Democrat in the morning and a Republican at night. I mean, our current president, Mike Bloomberg, they showed this right. They can slink in and find spots wherever they want. I didn't understand that somebody like a Zuckerberg. Like the reason why Facebook is so infected with QAnon and Donald Trump propaganda and misinformation is because that is where his marketing niche is. That's where he gets his money from. If he made more money through left wing information, I mean, he, 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 he would be appearing looking like Che Guevara. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's not about actual ideology. It's about anti-ideology. It's about getting past the point of elections. These people are interested in basically reversing the clock. And again, this is fascism. It's a different breed of it, mm. right? They're interested in moving back to a point in time where fascists, by the way, partnered with businesses. Like we always forget that part. Like fascists could not have come into being and into power if they didn't have the support of corporations and the media, because all of these people are wired to profit a certain way. And they come together and they form an alliance that is anti-democratic in nature. And we're always getting screwed. It doesn't matter on which side of this issue it is. Somehow or another, people 
are always being screwed because democracy is the thing that stands in way in the way of consolidating power and expediting wealth. Mm. And you know what that makes me think of uh, is is the 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 brands on on Twitter the the the, the brands that sort of have voice I mean it's it's spooky because Stakeums. yeah exactly Stakeums, Arby's whatever the fuck and it's like for me it's so it, it really is 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 corporeal and what I mean by that is like this sort of the, they're 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 making a a body they're making a a, a human being a, out of stitching to it together out of digital technology the corporation is becoming a human being in front of us you know what I mean like in other words like if it be We've always thought of corporations as as human beings legally, right? That's that's what's allowed them to sort of become uh, so powerful because they have the rights, and in fact have argued for having more rights than individual actual human beings. But to see like yeah, Arby's or Steakums or Taco Bell sort of like entering into like political discourse, like they'll have a like tweet about the fly on Pence's hair, uh, and they're like they're like one of us, you know, like they're they're they're, they're just an individual like us. That's uh, what do you what do you think of that? Because that's something Something that is 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 sort of a new feature in the way that corporations are expressing themselves, and yet when I look when I think back on being like in a, a, an '80s or '90s kid, I, it feels like corporations were always trying to be our friend and always trying to like be like you know our buddies and and the most important most important element of our life. Yeah. So first off, I, I you know I got pretty deep in uh, American Rule. I was looking into um, um, oh. Man, that's terrible. I can't remember the name now. Uh, it's uh, Sigmund Freud's nephew, uh, Bernays, Edward mm. Bernays. Oh, yeah, of course. Who, oh, yeah. So, you know, Bernays comes around. He's like, oh, absolutely. The way to sell more stuff is to appeal to people's psychology and their unconscious needs and desires. Meanwhile, I'm talking to you and I have books around my room because I'm an academic and I need people to understand I'm smart because of inherent insecurities, mm. right? <laughs> You know, and, and, you know, and then, you know, it's totally like the thing that I wear. Like, and the problem is that we get so lost. And I think this is actually not just one of the biggest existential problems that we don't talk about, but it has been in modern history. And that is the fact that there is a difference between who we are and what we present to the world. And the problem in the conflict between the two is all about capitalism. It's all about selling yourself as a product. And that's everything from what you wear to how you style your hair to how you carry yourself, the things that you say, and now the things that you like, retweet, and talk about on Twitter and Facebook, right? You're selling yourself as a product. Meanwhile, that has been hijacked, and particularly since the 1960s and 1970s, when the counterculture, they were like, that's a good way to sell blue jeans. Mm -hmm. That's a great way to sell records, right? And all of a sudden, you can just buy the liberal persona while making money at your job and while doing this and taking advantage of people. And so it turned us into basically political hypocrites because of that divide between who we are and who we project. And now, and this is one of the craziest things, and it's, I have to say, I'm glad we're talking about it, but this is not a thing that you can talk about everywhere and not a thing that you can talk about with everybody. For I'm sure. Glad we're talking yeah. about it. A big thing that's happening right now, particularly on social media, is the idea of wokeness and how wokeness has now become a corporate product. Like you have something like a Nike who, by the way, exploits people all around the world right? Left and right. And by the way, is doing incredible damage with this mass production to our environment. It's oppressing people. You know, it's involved with like sweatshops. It's involved in all of this exploitation. Meanwhile, how many millions did they pay a Colin Kaepernick to say, you know what, we're on that. Mm -hmm. And as a result, everybody in America who is desperate to appear liberal and on the right side of the cultural divide and debate, then it buys Nike, which by the way, weren't people boycotting that a few years ago because of sweatshops and mm -hmm. oppression. And they all do it. And they're so smart about this. And it's to the point where like the Walt Disney Corporation, which I talked about in, um, in American Rule, they had Nazis working at Disney World and on the <laughs> yeah. table, yeah. right? Yeah. You, you, you have Walt Disney, who was not just exploitive, not just anti-Semitic, but was one of the biggest cultural and political propagandists in American history. 
This guy all of a sudden is putting out movies that there are brand consultants and wokeness consultants who are telling them the little touches to put into every movie that will signal politically to people that all of a sudden they can like this movie because it's at a level of liberal to them. Mm. It is one of the most ingenious, insidious scams that there is, yeah. and it's repulsive. Yeah, it's 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 really, really uh, sinister when you put it that way, because what it does is, you know, when you see see um you know Colin Kaepernick doing a, you know a, sort of a black lives matter for Nike like part of you is thinking this is a victory this is an amazing yep. victory of like because because we have such a virulent right wing in this country because the country right. really is racist because cops really are killing black people at a rate you know all those things are true and if you're concerned about that you're like oh shit like Nike is on the side yep. of the movement yes but what's really happening is something so fucking ugly because they are yeah. that they that Nike and these corporations are the primary machine through which capitalism yeah. creates uh, and accelerates all those fucking ugly things we hate about society. But it's it's all personal. You know, it, wokeness is about like you performing your sort of goodness. Yep. Um, and, and yeah, it has been directed that way, you know, because like, uh, you know, wokeness in, in terms of just like the impulse to to sort of be aware of history and be aware of racism and that sort of thing. That's a good impulse. I think that's a good social, positive social development. But to turn it into this individualized expression is something really, really horrible. And it's part of that thing we're talking about is sort of like the corporation becoming a human being. And when it becomes a yep. human being, it becomes this perfect human being that's not racist and, you know, a, a, a perfect expression of a human being at the same time what this structure does as we're talking about is 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 ignite hell and and end the world really like literally we could trace the the death of of the planet to a, to corporations and what they've done so that part of it is really really scary well and it's it's really weird too because it's like you know, a, a lot of what has happened, I think, in the modern era, and it's one of the reasons why I think Donald Trump, again, has caused this illusion to flicker, is, you know, you have this giant global, you know, economic structure, and it resembles fascist hierarchical oppression, right? You have white countries, first world countries at the top that exploit the second and third world people, people of color, make them take jobs where they're not paid as much, they're mistreated, maybe they're getting their hands cut off, we're taking their minerals, we're deciding their laws for them, we're not allowing them self-rule. That's fascism. But because of the global economic structure, it looks like it's the market. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's just how the market works. It's not us. Like I turn that machine on, but I don't know what it's doing, which, by the way, <laughs> yeah. is the essence. It's the essence of not just new woke like conservatism, but that's the essence of neoliberalism. And those things come together and they work really, really well. I mean, there's a reason why Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan were great buddies. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They didn't agree on anything, but they understood that there were certain people who should be above other people. And so that whole structure has held firm. Well, now with Donald Trump, he represents a new vision for how this should work. It's not going to have that veneer of the happy market and the fair market, right? We actually have neo-fascists around the world. They are like very, very closely knit. They share information. They're, they're using the same tactics, the same radicalization. A lot of the times it appears that they're organized. And all of a sudden you're seeing this structure. They're trying to take it over. Like when Donald Trump says, America first, get rid of, you know, globalism or whatever, they don't want to destroy globalism. They want to own it because it's a wonderful machine and it has all of these features that are built into it. And so what we're actually dealing with is this really, really fucked up reality that has been created and used and weaponized. And now it's about who controls it. And especially, by the way, you I, I thought you said it great which is the, this idea of nations is going to screw us when the climate catastrophes come. Mm -hmm. It's going to be so bad. I and think I, they're I, here. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, when we have millions of climate refugees, yeah. 
what we have seen so far with people at the border, forced hysterectomies, you know, families being separated, this is going to seem like small change yeah. compared to what if these fascists have control and they're not beaten back. When we get to the point of millions of climate refugees, I mean, it's going to be bad, uh, really, really bad. Those are some of my worst uh, apocalyptic nightmare scenarios. I mean, honestly, living here in um, in Southern California, we've you know, we just had uh, uh, we were in experiencing the, the, the first like modern giga fire of like a million acres uh there's no stopping this august fire and the, the 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 air got so smoky just where i'm at and i'm not even i'm hundreds of miles from anywhere that it really made me think you know that stuff that mike davis is saying about like california becoming an uninhabitable place to me is such a a, a, a fucked up irony of manifest destiny is like people running backwards, like literally going the other way and fleeing into the Arizona desert and fleeing back into Oklahoma. And we don't have a, we, we're not ready for that. I mean, you're talking you're talking about like sort of, the, you know, national borders. But even within yeah. our own fucking State. states, we will see people turn savage against each other. Um, and, and especially, you know, I think if we have the sort of um, the sort of attitude that 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 you know that that Trump is embodying, you know, has brought yep. out. Um, you know, I, I honestly, I, I'm I'm honestly surprised there hasn't been more like MAGA violence. But I think we we probably we may see some around the election. Okay, a, a couple things. So I'm so glad that you brought that up. I I, I could talk about this for hours. <laughs> it, it's it's yeah. madness when and it's the stuff that people should be talking about. Totally. Yeah. Um, so actually, so again, like the project I'm working on, like I'm relearning Western civilization, man, I'm learning about the fall of Rome right now. And I just want to go outside because I'm like <laughs> finding paragraphs. It's like, that's when climate change and a pandemic really took a toll on third century Rome. And I'm like, I'm sorry. Yeah. What, what, what mm -hmm. are we talking about? And then all of a sudden you see that as Rome started faltering, they started telling their outer provinces, they were like, Hey, we can't help you anymore. Good luck. You know? Like America has gotten to the point, and this is the sad truth, we're a failing nation. Like we can't even, like we can't respond to crises anymore. Like if you get hit by a hurricane, you're shit out of luck. Mm. You know, if there's a pandemic, we can't even marshal a response. We can't deal with education, infrastructure, healthcare, any of the things a nation is supposed to actually provide its people. Those are off the board. And when you have a failing nation, the only thing the nation can offer is violence and oppression. That's it. Oh, you're you're complaining too much. Here's some violence. You better <laughs> shut up. Right. Here's more violence or we'll kill you. The problem is that we have expanded and we have we have we have grown to a point where we can't grow anymore or we've lost the momentum and the inertia and now it's going to start collapsing in on itself. And that's the big question that we have to face. We have to understand that we have made a bunch of really wrong mistakes because we thought that America was the greatest nation in the world and hegemony was our right, right? That led to a lot of wars. It led to a lot of missteps and it led to a lot of like psychic and cultural and political damage. So now we're in a position where this country is starting to fail and American hegemony is coming undone. So we have a choice. Do we go ahead and decide how to handle this thing the best way and start to become a member of a global community? Do we start actually treating people well and start admitting what we've done wrong and realizing the lies of the past have led us here and that we've made mistakes? Or do we believe that we're perfect and it's a conspiracy against us? And as a result, we should all drink bleach and probably stand next to our sick president mm -hmm. and get whatever he's got. You know, and those are the those are honest to God, the choices like that's not hyperbole. It's the it's the choice that will define us moving forward, probably the rest of our lives. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, it's funny because uh, when uh, I've told this story many times, it's funny you mentioned ha reading Howard's in in 2003. I think that's about the time that I was reading it, too, because the Iraq war was happening and I had a desire to sort of understand a, a, a wider picture um, but I remember, you know, so I was 22 years old when September 11th happened and it was like uh, I was out of college and, and and really, you know, ready to think about the world in a different way. You know, that's a very that's, I think that the, the couple years after college for people that are go to college um, can, can be a really kind of tricky time because I'd never really been outside an institution. But that's when yeah. September 11th happened. And I remember thinking we are going to be dealing with this reality for the rest of my life. Like, I think I'm going to be, I remember just saying to my roommate as we're like taking bong loads on the couch thinking we're going to be, we're going to be talking about war for the rest of our lives. But now, you know, what you just said about the, about pandemic, 
you know, uh, th- I think, you know, th- that idea of returning to normal at any point is is more and more people don't really even talk about that anymore. You know, it feels like uh, this is going to be something that we're going to be uh, dealing with the repercussions of for for ever. Yeah. So here, here's we started this talking about optimism and nihilism. Right. 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 So I, I, I want to put this out there on, on the idea of normal. Yeah. Why the hell do you want to go back to normal? Because I don't know if people remember it. And I understand that people are suffering right now. And there's a lot of people who would break their back to get a job. And I understand that that that's real. Right. But I have to tell you, we've been exploited and our human decency has been bled from us for a long time. And I think we're all aware of. It. Yeah. We don't, we don't have to do that because if we go back to normal, I have to tell you that this pandemic has, there's a lot of meetings that are even happening tonight and a lot of very nice boardrooms that are like, how do we use this new Zoom culture to our advantage? And yeah, you know, what is a 40 hour work week? And what are, you know, uh, wh- wh- why, why don't children work? Like maybe we could get children, you know, harvesting data or maybe we could get, you know, with their little fingers, get on a keyboard or whatever. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like there are conversations about how to use normal and there always have been. Like we are at a moment where this thing is starting to come unwound. Why don't we use it? Why don't we figure out something better? And why don't we use this chaos as a moment to sow something like better and realer and more human? Yeah, I agree. And uh, but but then I'm also like, OK, I, I'm on board. And then I'm like, where do I go? Where do I sign up? You know what? I, the, I, I think that the, these conversations always end up that way for me. I mean, I, I can remember, um, you know, the, this moment in my life at, around September 11th, thinking through these, you know, the end point of the logic of trying to overcome these systems and just being like, I don't know what to do. And I think that a lot of that's a very common feeling. Right. I mean, we're told by celebrities, naked celebrities, vote, 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 vote. Um, and, and that's, I, I think that most people think of that as politics, but you know, most people don't participate in that. First of all, like the majority of voting, Amer- Amer- nope. uh, you know, eligible voting Americans don't. Um, but also it's, there's this thought of like, God, you know, I'm on board with like everything you're saying, but how do I, how do I, um, join that? And that's, that's, I guess that's the story of, of, of politics. So in some ways. I, I would say the paralyzing nature of it is on purpose. Yeah. It goes back to that idea of spectacle. We're supposed to think that politics is a thing that has nothing to do with us. It takes place in Washington, D.C., and you can watch it on the cable news networks. And if you don't like the show, you should tweet about it the same way that you tweet about so you think you can dance. You know, right. like it's, it's totally. a reality show. It's a reality show that occasionally we vote for, like, a you know, American Idol. I would make this argument. I I vote. Absolutely. I'm going to break my hand voting for Joe Biden because I think Donald Trump is an existential threat. I'm not going to feel (laughs) great about it, about fracking. Okay, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to vote because I want to. You're voting for fracking, you piece of shit. Got to do it. So (laughs) but I will say what I think the problem is, is that capitalism and neoliberalism and looming fascism has destroyed communal bonds. Mm-hmm. It has pitted us against each other yeah. for every little scrap and nugget of resource that we can find. We're living in a time of artificial austerity. There's no reason why education isn't better, infrastructure isn't better, why we don't have health care. It's because it's a redistribution project to the military industrial complex, and it always, always has been. Right. And on, and on top of that, the way our tax code and we have a fucking billionaire president, supposedly, who paid seven hundred and fifty dollars in taxes. But we don't have time to talk about that. I would make the argument that that atomization of society that has taken place because of artificial austerity has kept us unable to community organize. It's kept us unable to come together in solidarity and enact the change that we need because we're all opponents. We all hate one another and we're all engaged in a trench warfare battle for just it, it's like um, we, on the on the Muckrake podcast not too long ago. We talked about network mm. and we were talking about when Howard Beale like finally loses it. And he says, you know what? Fine. The world is terrible. Just leave me alone in my house. Just leave me at home. Leave me alone at home. And it feels like that's where we've gotten. And we've gotten to the point where we don't, you know, maybe we don't know our neighbors. And maybe, by the way, the neighbors don't vote like us and we're afraid we're going to have to go out and get in a gun battle in the street, right? But all of this is about that dichotomy of I'm this, you're that, we are now opponents. And it doesn't matter if it's Democrat, Republican, Trump, Biden, or, uh, you know, I'm in a union, you're not in a union. All of a sudden, we are at each other's throats. And as a result, we have no ability to enact change because our biggest uh, our, our biggest strength is our ability to organize. And when we organize, American history shows us we win, that yeah. that pendulum of power swings. 
Yeah. Um, but that, that thing of being alone at home just seems like it's, yep. it's, it's, it's uh, something that's become, you know, it, it's chilling to hear you talk about the boardrooms because I can imagine them, you know, uh, you know, doing the shock doctrine opportunism of, of what they're going to do with this. Because, I, I mean, to me, I, I sense like this is this could be the end of public education. You know, I, I really feel like uh, if we keep going in this direction, they will find a way to get what uh, there's a um, George Carlin bit where, you know, where he talks about sort of, you know, the American dream is, uh, you know, you got to be asleep to believe it. You gotta be asleep. All, yeah, all that all that stuff. But also he talks about like um, there's this really chilling bit that's not even like it's not even comedy. It's literally just like him preaching. And he's just like he's just like, you know, they want your social security. They want public education and they're going to fucking get it. They'll fucking get it. They're coming for it. And I thought. That's from like 1990 something, you know, uh, where he's screaming on his HBO special about the desire that was you know, already present among conservative groups to destroy public education. To me, this is the opportunity to to really just turn it into charter schools and go backwards to the 19th century. And, you know, you're talking about kids working like how many people I mean, they would rather ha say they would rather create a program that says the kids, your kids can work now and can be an income stream then give us economic relief. You know what I mean? Like, in other words, there's this mythology that you always have to work. We didn't get into that. And then you and I are going to have to have another program, Jared, because I feel like you you and I have a lot to talk about. But um, but it's, it feels like a lot of these trends are are, 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 are present in, in really disturbing ways right now. And the pandemic is a is a tremendously um, huge opportunity one way or the other. Um, and, and to me, it's it's scary to think about the opportunity that 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 elites will will take with it. Yeah, and the one thing that you didn't mention in all of that is they really want to destroy public schools so they can get back to segregation. Mm, I mean, they, mm -hmm. they yeah. want all well, the yeah. academy. Sure. And, and, the, and, the, and the thing that everybody now wants to talk about pro-life or you know pro-choice, that's not the animating ideology of the right. Like, they, you know, they, they're not actually pro-life. The pandemic has shown us that. They're not interested in whether or not people live or not. It's just that abortion made for a better political cudgel than segregation. Mm. Because all of these groups were segregation first. That was the animating influence that took took over in the 1950s and 1960s. Mm -hmm. It's a religious white supremacy that it's at play here. And so you're exactly right. We'll get to the point where are you going to send your kid to school or can your kid make, you know, five dollars an hour? Yeah. And by the way, five dollars an hour might be a good job in that era. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that, that might that might be halfway decent when these jackals get done with it. But they are. They're trying to roll it back to like a Gilded Age type situation. Yeah. And, and because they were forced to, to they were forced to give people rights. They didn't want to give you a 40 hour work week. They didn't want to give you weekends. They didn't want to give you health care. They didn't want to get to the point where kids weren't on the factory floor or losing their arms and minds. Like that's not that, they didn't do that out of the charity of their hearts, which, by the way, every textbook in the South will tell you. It was like, you know, Rockefeller is like, I really like those kids. They've got gumption. They mm. should be at home. That's not how it works. This whole thing has been a scam and they have to be made to give people rights. And it's when we remember that we can make them is when we can make change. Mm, yeah, that, that Uber model uh, seems like it's one that that is trying very hard to, to, to capitalize on this. In California, they're, they're, they're trying to pass Proposition 22. It says uh, Uber drivers are not employees. They're, you know, yep. they're independent contractors. And I mean, it's, and, and you see like literally newspapers like the San Francisco Chronicle saying vote for Prop 22 because it will maintain the independence of the worker and keep the gig economy running strong. And I'm like, holy fucking shit. The, the newspaper, <laughs> you know, the newspaper is with Uber, with Lyft in doing exactly what you're talking about in terms of reversing the, the hard won rights of workers. I mean, it's horrifying to watch and we know we know we know what the game is and I'm I'm with you and in, in hoping that that people are waking up to this because of how fucking nasty it's become I mean the pandemic has brought out a real darkness and I think that that's that there's a, there's there's gonna be there is a reaction to that as well you know people don't want to well, feel uh, bad I'll, ju I'll just say as a independent journalist and columnist who doesn't get a job writing a weekly column somewhere because they want independent contractors that they can pay per article, pit against one another, and not give health care and benefits, I can tell you that everybody who owns the modes of production automatically moves in this direction. Mm -hmm. This is one of the major problems also is that everybody thinks 
that like the media isn't really partisan. Like Trump was right about that. It is a completely partisan thing. Like it, it and, and, and it's in a way that people don't understand because they're thinking left and right. Right. They're like Fox News is right and MSNBC is left. It's like, well, MSNBC is center left and it's center left from a cosmopolitan pro corporation standpoint. And so is CNN. You know, like yeah. it's not the same thing as being left. No, like, they're like, I think of that as technocratic capitalism, neoliberal, right. cor corporate neoliberal, you know. And and I'll say this. One of the things and, and I've been thinking about this all day, so I'm glad I finally get to say it out loud to you before <laughs> I probably I'm probably going to go on my podcast and yell about this. Nice. For a half hour. <laughs> <laughs> like everyone today was like, can you believe how effective Pete Buttigieg is going on Fox News and telling them off? It's like, oh, no, Christ. in a sane world, he's a Republican. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point is you have a Republican Party that is just so far right that they are in fascism. And then you have everybody else under the same umbrella. I mean, there's a reason why like Project Lincoln is now like part of the Democratic Party. Jesus. It's the people, yeah. they're, you know, uh, William Crystal. Is yep. over there yeah. now, yeah. And and you look at it, and and all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, and also the Democratic Party helped support the Iraq War and the Patriot Act, all of this stuff. And you realize that our our idea of what politics is in America has no relationship with reality. It's all lost in this illusion that we've been talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And those and, and the fact that like Bill Crystal is over there, it's like this is Bill Crystal's woke now, you know, which tells you like how empty this is and how much um, it's not, you know, wokeness, no matter what you think of it, it's not up to I don't think, you know, it's up to the task of confronting fascism in how serious yep. it and how serious it really is. And that's what's frustrating about it to me is sort of thinking, you know, this is this is a game that we're going to get run over uh, by, by, by people that are serious, you know, people that are like dead serious um but jared yates sexton i i've been wanting to talk to you for a long time thanks so much for coming on the show i appreciate it thanks man that was great Okay, that is going to do it for Nostalgia Trap today. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed our conversations. Um, and thank you to Jared Yates Sexton for sharing his ideas. We're going to definitely talk again. I thought uh, we had a really fun time figuring out a little bit of how we came to uh, um, understand a little bit more about how this country operates and, and, and what we're really in, sort of the, the depth of the story that we're in in the 21st century. So I hope you appreciated that conversation as as much as I did. Uh, go out and get his book, American Rule, How a Nation Conquered the World but failed its people. Uh, and go subscribe to Nostalgia Trap on Patreon. We're having a really fun time with Danny Bessner talking about LA cinema in the 90s. And we've got a lot more of that stuff on the way, including our Clueless episode coming out later this week. Uh, so thanks as always for those that are supporting the show and listening to the show and sharing it on social media. All of that really makes us happy. Uh, and we'll be talking to you very soon. All right, take care. See ya.